Good evening, uh, and welcome to you all uh, to this joint symposium of the Australian Academy of Science and the Australian Academy of Law. My name is Alan Robertson, the President of the Australian Academy of Law. On behalf of both academies, I acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and to their elders past, present and emerging. In particular, I pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which uh, I speak. This is the fourth joint symposium of the two academies, uh, now held annually. Uh, the series was inaugurated in uh, 2018 uh, in the long distant times when we could uh, meet in person. It feels like long distant times. Uh, we were hoping this year to meet in the uh, Sh Shine Dome, the iconic Shine Dome in Canberra. Uh, but hopefully uh, next year's symposium uh, can be delivered there. Uh, but both academies are still uh, delighted to be able to bring uh, you this event online, wherever you are in Australia or indeed around the world. It's also my pleasure and privilege to introduce tonight's moderator, uh, the Honourable Dr. Annabel uh, Bennett, ACSC, a fellow of both academies, the Academy of Science and the uh, Academy <coughs> of Law. Uh, Annabel Bennett's uh, current positions, uh, I can't do justice to, they cover a page. Uh, they include being Chancellor of Bond University, the Chair of the ANSTO Board, uh, an Arbitrator of the Court of Arbitration for Sport, uh, a Director of the Garvin Institute of Medical Research and the Chair of the World Intellectual Property Organization Advisory Group of uh, Judges. Uh, she also practices as a barrister in an advisory role and as a mediator and arbitrator. Her former positions uh, leaving aside her current positions, uh, cover two pages. Uh, she was a judge of the Federal Court of Australia from May 2003 to March 2016. Uh, her CV demonstrates how inappropriate it is to refer to Annabelle Bennett as a retired judge of the Federal Court or indeed retired from anything. Please welcome Dr Annabelle Bennett. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alan. That's unbelievably kind and generous and welcome to everybody. Um, the academies were aiming to explore the topic of the uses and misuses of artificial intelligence in science and the law. So I guess my first reaction when, it, when, it, when the topic came up to me was, is this all of a sudden or has it crept upon us? Now, I'm a science fiction aficionado, and I can say that when I was watching Star Trek, obviously as a you know, tiny child, um, the which was the original Star Trek, the idea that you could walk up to a door and it opened was science fiction. Now we know that, uh, you know, uh, that wonderful William Shatner who played Captain James T. Kirk is about to go into space, which is an interesting change to uh, science fiction turning into reality. And in Brave New World Revisited, Aldous Huxley revealed how much of his original book had actually come to pass almost unnoticed. So now we have questions being answered differently all over the world of whether a machine can be an inventor for the purposes of the Patents Act. So for me, when this topic came up, I had to realize that for myself, maybe because of I'm a certain age, I, had to, I thought to myself, well, actually, what is machine learning? What is artificial intelligence? We use the words, but do we actually understand how it works? Is it a wonderful objective purveyor of data and evidence devoid of human error? Or is it a tool that, that can be manipulated willingly or unwillingly? Is it a tool that can or should replace human decision making with all of the latter's advantages and disadvantages? Now we have speakers today from science and the law who have expertise in considering these issues and others as they stand now and as they'll apply in the future. That is the future directions that this area can explore. Now, before we go in, I should say that in the interest of full disclosure, the two law speakers are known to me. Lyria Bennett-Moses is my daughter, and obviously the daughter of myself and my husband, David. And David is relevant in another way because he actually introduced Ed Santo's parents to each other. So that means that we are responsible for both of them being here to talk to you today. 
In any event, this is truly an area where science and the law can and should work together. It's also going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions of the panel. And believe me, I'm the first one to say there are no stupid questions in this developing area. So throughout the event, if you have any questions for the panel or a specific speaker, please enter them via the website or QR code on your screen. Now, as always is the case in this wonderful world of technology, we've had some technical difficulties and we are going to reorder um, the, the uh, speakers. And it may well be that our first speaker who we were hoping to have, uh, Professor Sventher Venkatesh, may not be able to join us because of uh, the technical difficulties in joining. So I'm going to move straight to um, our first speaker now who was always going to be a speaker, of course, is Professor Toby Walsh. Toby is the Scientia Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of New South Wales. He's a leading researcher in AI and leader of the Algorithmic Decision Theory Group at CSIRO Data 61. So over to Toby. Um, and let me begin by saying uh, I'm an AI researcher. I spent my whole professional life trying to work on building smarter uh, and more intelligent machines. And this is by far the most exciting time to be working in artificial intelligence. We do, we are making real progress. Um, it's not just opening doors automatically. Um, although I have an interesting story about opening doors automatically. Uh, those of you uh, who noticed that Facebook was down a couple of days ago, it comes down to doors not opening automatically. That when Facebook went down, all the systems in Facebook uh, went down as well. And the system administrators couldn't get into the server rooms because the, uh, the electronic door no longer would open. And my friends in the inside tell me that ultimately it took an ankle grinder to fix the Facebook problem where they actually uh, cut the door open. But uh, we are making real progress. Um, as an example, I, I mentioned something that, that blew my mind away when I was reading the scientific paper just quite recently which is that um, some AI researchers in the UK took the UK gene bank. There's a database of half a million genotypes. They've sequenced half a million genotypes of people in the UK. They've got all their phenotypical, all their physical characteristics, their medical records uh, to go alongside that. And using some relatively simple machine learning techniques, they're able now to predict how tall you're going to be to within an inch. So at birth, they can tell you, how tall you're going to be, but they can tell you actually more fundamentally interesting things. For example, they can tell you whether you're going to be susceptible to bowel cancer. That is the a third most common form of cancer, second deadliest form of cancer. And now we can tell you at birth whether, of course, there are, there are environmental factors that, that need to still trigger it, but now we can actually prevent you from uh, falling prey to, to bowel cancer by ensuring that you get tested from an early age if you are unlucky enough to have the, the genotype that, that makes you susceptible to that. But despite all that wonderful progress, it's not magic. This is, um, if you believed everything you read in the newspapers and added it all together, you might think that we are about to build machines that are as smart, if not way smarter than us. We've still got a long distance to go, but we can do very useful things, uh, like you say. And it's a, it's a dual use technology. There's immense good that you can do with it, but also the significant harms. And so actually I spend a lot of time discussing with the media and elsewhere about the ethical challenges that the technology is starting to throw up as it leaves the laboratory and starts becoming a everyday part of our lives. Now, it's worth pointing out that this is not the first technology to touch human lives. We've invented lots of other technologies in the past that have had significant consequences. And so um, we don't need too much in the, new, in the way of new ethics, at least. Uh, we'll come to law in a second, but at least in terms of new ethics, um, to understand some of the challenges that this technology is throwing up. Uh, and indeed, perhaps the best place to look is to look to medicine. Medicine is by its very nature a technology that literally touches people's human lives. Um, and it is a good starting point, and even, uh, might I say, almost an ending point in the discussions as to what are the ethical principles that should be guiding the um, safe deployment of this technology uh, within our lives. There is one exception, one new thing that AI brings that 
previous technologies, uh, medical technologies or other sorts of technologies never brought. And I'll come to that in a second. But if we look at medical, uh, tech, medical ethics, there are four cornerstones for medical ethics. Um, and they provide, actually, I believe, excellent cornerstones for understanding the sorts of ethical challenges that artificial intelligence throws up. So what are those four cornerstones? Beneficence, um, do net good. Non-maleficence, uh, closely related but, but significantly different, do no harm, worrying about um, the harms to the individual. Um, autonomy, respecting the autonomy of, in, of, of individuals um, in, in medical uh, ethics, as, as, as same in deployment of AI, we have to worry about respecting uh, human autonomy, about um, not being engaging in deceptive and other, other practices. Uh, and then the final cornerstone, uh, a rather uh, encompassing cornerstone, of justice, which brings in issues of uh, fairness uh, and equitability uh, and issues like this. So you might notice that there was one principle that I didn't mention that frequently gets mentioned in these conversations. Uh, one that, for example, is that the cornerstone at IBM's ethical uh, guidelines for how they're going to deploy AI, and that's transparency. I believe actually transparency is the most overrated ethical principle. Um, it is a means to an end and is not an end in itself. It, there are many settings where it may not be possible. Um, AI algorithms, at least certainly today, are very much black boxes. Um, and it's not clear to me that we would necessarily be able to open them out. We can build wonderful computer vision systems that can see the road and drive your autonomous car. But just like human vision is not something that we can explain, I'm not sure that we're ever going to be able to explain computer vision systems. Um, and indeed, there are a number of settings where it's not desirable for us to explain how the systems work. It is a good thing, for example, that Google does not explain how its um, machine learning AI is used to serve up search results for you, because that would open it to being manipulated even more than it is today. Um, and for, our final observation is that humans are not transparent. Human decision making is not transparent. Um, I go to my doctor and I put my life in her hands. Um, and I can do that with a lot of trust, um, not, be, not because she's transparent, but because I know that we have built institutions in which I don't have to be an expert on medicine. I don't have to ask her always for why she is prescribing a particular medicine, but that I know that if she kills too many of her patients or she prescribes medicines that are dangerous, that she will be struck off the register um, and lives will be saved. Um, so transparency, I believe, is somewhat it, 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 where it's possible uh, and where it, it, it doesn't introduce problems like uh, um, hackers, then may, it may be a useful means to an end, the end being some, some greater ethical principle like fairness, but it's, it's not an end in itself. So I, I mentioned there was one exception, one new thing that AI brings as a technology. Um, and it's, that's something that we've never seen with any other technology. Um, and that brings us back to autonomy. I was talking previously about the autonomy of humans, that we have to respect uh, people's human autonomy. That's a, a fundamental human right. Um, but we also have to now worry about the autonomy of machines, that we are now building machines with capabilities that allow them largely independently of us to make decisions on their own. When you sit in your autonomous car, you say, take me home, and it makes the sort many decisions on how it's going to perform that large task. Um, and those decisions uh, may have life or death consequences. And so, not surprisingly, uh, we've had seen some of the most interesting, some of the most novel ethical debates around uh, these issues of the autonomy of machines. We see this in autonomous cars, uh, the famous trolley problem that you may have heard of, where a machine may have to make a split-second life or death decision as to, as to an accident's about to happen and who might it unfortunately have to kill. Uh, but also we see this another issue that greatly concerns me, uh, that's the autonomy in, of, of machines in the, in the battlefield, um, whether we should hand over the decision as to who lives or who dies in warfare to machines, something that I think would take us to a very challenging um, ethical, legal and moral setting if we did. Um, and then also we see it in, in another issue that's going to be discussed, I'm sure, tonight, which is in um, the autonomy of machines to make independent creations of themselves and, and how are we going to have to adjust our, our laws and ideas about intellectual property if it is the machines are autonomously of us um, making novel creations. Um, 
Aside from autonomy, um, I think one of the most other interesting novel parts of, of, of the ethical debate um, that we are now seeing is that um, various red lines are starting to be drawn in the sand, that there are some uses of these technologies that are going to be very disruptive. And so we've seen very recently um, a vote was, was made just uh, yesterday or the day before the European Parliament um, calling for facial a, a ban on, on public use of facial recognition. Um, I used to believe that um, there was some, some potentially useful uses of facial recognition to, to a, a enable access to people with disability and the like. Uh, but now I actually think it's such a destructive, such, su such a potentially dangerous technology that probably um, we shouldn't be working on it at all. Uh, but other examples of red lines in terms of social credit scoring and subliminal manipulation and micro targeting of political adverts, where we might decide um, that the, the downsides of the technology are so great um, that we perhaps should not work on them at all. Uh, so I'll end there and, and look forward to the other speakers. Well, well, I must say you have absolutely opened up a lot of areas there. I mean, you've, uh, you've introduced, I think, a number of issues. I, I mean, I, it reminds me of the fact that I was uh, once at a, uh, at a talk where they, where they used the examples of what is life and using the characteristics of what constitutes life. One of them was, you know, we have to think intellectually, you know, and all the things. And the other one is to reproduce yourself. And of course, uh, if you look at many of the definitions of that, uh, machines by means of machine learning uh, could, or an artificial intelligence could be called a new life form. And that brings all my sci-fi experience um, in reading and wonderful shows to the fore. So I'm sure that you've raised a lot of issues that people are going to ask you questions about and they're going to give rise to the discussion. So thank you so much, Toby. That was really, really interesting and a wonderful and challenging insight as to some of the issues uh, that are raised by what you say is, well, you you suggested, of course, that some of this is is old, but of course it's also very new. And of course we take so much for granted. I did the Apple Samsung case, and um, the idea of the touch screen, you know, or the, or the you know the ability to have a touch screen smartphone was such a new thing. And by the time the case came up, when something doesn't work when you tap it, you start tapping it even harder because it should. And uh, that's how our, our values change, I think, as we go. But of course. Um, this is, this is a really, it, it raises so many issues as you did. I mean, the, the, the cars give rise to privacy issues of, of sharing, of um, even the sharing of who's wearing what car to transmit that information to the following car. Anyway, I'm not going to go into this anymore myself because I'm going to urge people to ask those questions, to formulate them and ask them. And now I'm going to turn to Ed Santo. Ed served as Australia's Human Rights Commissioner from 2016 to 2021. And he's recently started as industry professor responsible technology at UTS. He leads a major UTS initiative to build Australia's strategic capability in AI and new technology, which will support Australian business and government to be leaders in responsible innovation by developing and using AI that is powerful, effective and fair. And what is even more interesting is that um, Ed, as the lawyer, is going to give us a little bit of an understanding, too, about what AI and machine learning constitute. So welcome, Ed, over to you. Thank you very much, Annabelle, for that warm introduction. Um, I'm coming to you from Warimba land um, in uh, Gadigal country, and I pay tribute to the elders um, past, uh, present and emerging of this land. Um, so there's a lot of hype when it comes to artificial intelligence. And uh, some of that hype is completely unjustified. Um, but I'm at risk of engaging in some of that hype myself because the thesis I'm gonna try and advance over the next um, 10 minutes or so is that AI is changing in a very profound way um, how we reason and how we search for truth. And that, that search for truth is very important because one thing that um, scientists and lawyers have in common is just that. Uh, a core to our mission is a search for truth, for insight about the world around us. Um, and that may be in, in, in different contexts and different areas, but, but that, that fundamental belief in the importance of truth is, is something we share. Um, it's true that I'm going to start with a bit of science 
And um, Annabelle has pointed to something which is all too um, kind of obvious to me, which is uh, having a lawyer try and talk to you about science is a bit like having a, a, an English person trying to teach you French. Um, fortunately, Toby uh, is in the position of being able to provide a rebuttal or a clarification uh, if, if I missed it. So um, uh, th there's only one truly scientific slide that I'm, I'm showing you, and it's this. Uh, because at the heart of AI, I mean, AI, as, as um, excellent scholars like Liria have pointed out, it's, it's, it's not a term of art. If anything, it's a marketing term. Um, and, and really, it, it brings together a cluster of technologies and techniques. But, but one of them is, is machine learning. And machine learning is very important because it's driving so much of what we see as this sort of renaissance in interest in, in AI. Um, so I'm just going to quickly walk you through how a typical, um, relatively simplified version of, of how a machine learning system works in practice. Um, the, the idea is you want your computer, your machine, um, to be able to recognize useful insights um, and, and spit those out for you. So for example, if you're a bank and you're trying to determine whether someone is going to be a good customer or a bad customer, you, you feed it a whole bunch of what's known as training data. And that's largely could be decades worth of previous um, bank decisions um, in, in home loans. Some of them you'll have uh, in, in retrospect determined were good decisions. You were pleased you, you lent the money to um, a certain group of customers and you'll label them as good customers. And some of them with the passage of time will turn out to have been not so good customers. So you'll, you'll label them accordingly. Um, and the, the quote unquote magic of the machine, um, the, the algorithm will be uh, kind of searching for patterns. So what are the sorts of features uh, in that, um, in, in those two cohorts uh, will, will be common? So what, what are the sorts of features that will be common among um, people who turn out to be good customers and, and, and vice versa? And so that then that what, what that allows you to do is when you have a new prospective customer, you um, kind of identify um, as many characteristics about that customer, you feed it into your model, and it should be able to come up with a prediction. Is this person likely to be a good customer or a bad customer? Um, now, um, I've, I've chosen um, to start with an example, uh, which many of us may experience once or twice in our lives, not, not very commonly, but, but this sort of technique is, is happening all the time. I suspect today, Everyone listening in will have experienced this in, in many, um, uh, many ways, even if you haven't noticed it. So the example um, I'll just quickly give is, um, is email, right? So uh, if, if you're using one of the kind of leading um, email uh, platforms, uh, it will have done much the same thing as I've just described. So it will crawl through you know, millions, perhaps even billions of emails and uh, through a labeling process, it will have been able to understand, or sorry, not understand, but but um, perceive or identify the, the sorts of features that are associated with genuine emails. Um, by genuine email, I don't necessarily mean an email that you want to receive, but an email that you should receive, um, as distinct from uh, emails that are spam, you know, that are, that are there to kind of um, scam you out of your money, not not genuine in, in any way, shape or form. And so what, what, what happens, of course, is that um, there's a filter system and uh, most of the, the emails that, that turn out to be spam end up in your spam folder. Occasionally, and this actually happened to me today in a very um, kind of upsetting way, really, um, an email that I sent to someone ended up in, in their spam folder. So, so occasionally, um, it, 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 there, there will be mistakes. Um, and um, that's the nature of correlation. It won't be um, a kind of a, a, an analysis, a deductive analysis like, um, like, like you know, is, is prized most, most highly, especially in the legal system. It'll be based on correlations. And so, so some of those correlations will be meaningful, some of them won't. So what I'm trying to say to you is that the heart of machine learning is a focus on correlation. And we've, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. That's always been at the heart of inductive uh, reasoning. But we are relying more on correlation than we ever have in human history because of this rise in um, the use of machine learning. Um, and, and the difficulty is, uh, as I kind of intimated before, not all correlations are meaningful. 
Um, there are lots of examples. Um, the, the the example I've just put on the screen now um, comes from a, um, a website of, of an academic who loves to show this, this point, which is that not all correlations are meaningful. So the one I'm showing here is the correlation between the rise in cheese consumption in the United States and uh, the rise in the number of people who pretty sadly die um, by getting tangled in their bed sheets. Now, I'm very confident that that is a meaningless correlation. They do correlate reasonably closely, but it's it's meaningless, right? Like it's, it is just pure coincidence. It's white noise. Um, but but nevertheless, um, there does there, there may appear to be a correlation between those two um, unconnected things. And so so the point is. Um, we need to work very hard to sift out um, what are the meaningful correlations and what are the meaningless correlations, the, the kind of red herrings. Um, and, and, and that's very important because um, the, the promise of, uh, of, of being able to use uh, machine learning through big data and so on is that we get to insights. And sometimes we do. I, I quite like this, this cartoon, which is the last slide I'm gonna share, because it, it shows how this can go really, really well. You start with data points, you get information, the knowledge, um, suddenly you're able to see, oh, there seems to be this connection between this one thing, um, you know, maybe people who um, are more likely to return to my home loan example, um, people who are, are you know, um, from a particular postcode seem to be more likely to pay back um, uh, their home loans on time. That's a really interesting thing. Um, sometimes you get wisdom from, from that because you say, well, we think therefore that it must be because of uh, this, this is the connection to, to their postcode. Um, and sometimes that just goes terribly, terribly awry. Um, and that's how you end up with the bottom right hand corner, the conspiracy theory. You, you join the dots together in a way that doesn't give you insight at all. It just gives you a completely false picture of the world. And so um, I, I guess just to, to round off what I'm trying to say, um, the more we use uh, machine learning techniques in big decisions, really momentous decisions, decisions that affect um, people in profound ways, the more we have the capacity to, um, to, to, to see our insights that would otherwise be hidden from us. Um, and, and I say that because what uh, I guess modern AI is able to do is through this pattern recognition, if you couple that with a massive increase in computing power, it's able to kind of look for, um, to use an anthropomorphic term, uh, you know, patterns or correlations that we just simply wouldn't have time to do if it was just humans um, kind of performing that task. And so the, 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 the exciting thing is that there are ways of automating or, or ideally semi-automating that process that, that, are, that allows us to get genuine insights. But the more we kind of cede control over to the machine without effective oversight and um, um, you know, uh, quality measures put in place to make sure um, that uh, we're able to sift between correlations that are meaningful and correlations that aren't, the more likely we are that we're also going to not just have insights, but also um, be led down uh, incorrect paths that will take us away from the truth. And those, you know, the, the difficulty is those two things are happening simultaneously. There is both good and bad happening. So um, I might leave off there and hand back to uh, Annabelle as our chair um, and uh, look forward to participating in the Q&A later on. Well, thanks, Ed. Thank you. I want to thank you for uh, simplifying the issues. I want to thank you for making it clear that there, it's very straightforward, that there, there's no complexity in this, that it's as easy as pie to deal with. I think that's terrific. Uh, the answer is not, you didn't. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. You know, what you've done beautifully for us, I think, is to is to raise um, the good news, bad news story. And I mean, it's very hard. It's hard for the scientists to, to deal with it. And it's hard for the, for the lawyers to deal with it. I mean, having sat on, on cases myself where you look at the questions of whether uh, complex algorithms being applied in computers are they are they new inventions or is it just a bit you know a mere business method being uh, changed into a computer? It's, it depends on how you look at it. On one hand, these things you can say are very complex and it's very easy to say no, no, they're very straightforward. But this concept between um, 
what mankind can do and what it can be done by a machine and where, where it can veer off in terms of correlations that are uh, only objectively uh, utilised rather than applying um, logic to them. Uh, your human logic to them, of course, is another issue, and I think it's going to raise a lot of questions. There are already some questions that have come up that I'll deal with later as to uh, patentability and creativity, and we'll come back to those. But now um, let's let's now turn to Lyria, because Lyria uh, has also spent uh, a lot of time working in this field. Lyria is the director of the Allens Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation at UNSW, and she's written about the limitations of AI and data-driven approaches to decision-making in government, law enforcement and the legal system, and thought about why it's crucial for everyone to understand how smart machines are impacting on our society and also in the interaction between um, law and science on what the law should be doing about it, um, too much, too little, or um, you know, what do we do? How, how much do we interfere with this ourselves? So I'm gonna hand over to Miria. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to really bring law into this discussion. And there are two senses in which law interacts with artificial intelligence. There's the use of artificial intelligence in legal institutions or legal practice. Um, and then there's the law's regulatory role. Um, and that's not just laws that mention the word AI, um, but rather the ways in which different kinds of law, privacy law, discrimination law, tort law, consumer law, and so forth, operate in relation to both AI practices and of course AI companies. So of those two, both of which are really interesting, I'm gonna focus um, this evening on the second. So why do people want law to have a regulatory role in the context of AI? Well, there's various things that people are worried about and some of these have already been mentioned and some other things have been mentioned, but here's sort of my brief sketch. So some of them are associated with the idea of using insights from data to make decisions. And a lot of this was the focus of what Ed was talking about. But the, you know, what, what I want to focus on here is all of the sort of unfair bias challenges. So if data used to train a machine learning model is collected in circumstances influenced by real world bias, perhaps you're looking at crime databases or social media streams or who are the existing employees in an organization, then the system will learn those same biases that exist in the historic data. Alternatively, one might choose a machine learning model um, that ignores or, or dismisses the relevance of outliers or makes other assumptions in ways that effectively ignore particular categories of people. And this has been a big issue with gender as an example. Or a, a system might use particular variables like race or other variables that correlate with race to make decisions about people in circumstances where society has rightly decided that this is inappropriate. Now, all of those kinds of concerns can be a problem whether we're doing statistics by hand or whether we're using something like machine learning. Obviously, machine learning is faster and more efficient, but the same kinds of problems arise in both contexts. There are other issues, though, that are more specifically associated with automation. So if I'm going back to that AI in legal institutions, we might be worried about the lack of ability to make one's case outside the parameters of a computer system. Alternatively, we might be worried about bugs, errors, or poor design so that we get bad data. Um, and a really good example of that challenge is the government's robo-debt system. We might be worried about lack of accountability in a context where political and social systems assume, if you like, that it is humans that are accountable. We might be worried about killer robots, and I know that's a particular concern of Toby's. And then some other issues are at the intersection of both. Um, and Toby already raised the issue of lack of transparency, and we can debate the importance of that question. Um, but you know, the difficulty of creating reasons for a particular decision is sort of related to both the automation element um, as well as the um, data-driven element. And one can come up with more and the other speakers have. But what I wanna focus on now is what the legal response to that ought to be. So I agree, um, just to make that completely clear, that there needs to be a legal response to these issues. We can't just, as lawyers, ignore all of these challenges and hope that they go away because they certainly won't. But I disagree with at least some 
that suggest that the, what we really need is laws that specifically target artificial intelligence as such. And if I can have my slide um, now, please, on the screen. Excellent, thank you. Um, so what I want to look at in particular here is um, the Europeans' proposed um, regulation um, for artificial intelligence and comment on what I see as the sort of fundamental design flaw underlying that approach. So first of all, to be completely fair, the Commission was asked to draft an AI regulation and they did exactly what they were told to do. Um, so it's not a crit criticism of the people who put it together. My point is rather that they were given the wrong task, not that they did it badly. The task they were given is essentially one that we see all the time when law struggles with new technologies. The task was define the technology and then regulate it. Now at the top of the slide, um, what I've put there is the definition they came up with, which is ultimately tied to the methods used, which is set out in Annex um, I, which is also on the slide, as well as the connection to software um, and a few other things. Um, I'll let you read it yourselves. Um, of course, the point of this is if you do statistics by hand, um, that isn't artificial intelligence. But if you do exactly the same thing using software, it becomes artificial intelligence, even if you're using the same model or method. Um, now, the way the regulation works is there are prohibited practices, um, what Toby was talking about is the red lines. Um, and then there are also specific requirements for high risk AI systems. Um, and there's a definition of that in the regulation. I won't set it out in full, but things like safety components, um, things that are already regulated, or um, there's a list as well of other things that are high risk um, AI systems, including where they use biometric identification, where they're used in recruitment, polygraphs in law enforcement and so forth. It's quite long, too much to cover in slides or read. I um, mean, then what do you have to do if it's a high risk AI system? Various things, things like risk management, data governance, um, transparency, having a human in the loop and so forth. There are also some requirements in the regulation, the draft regulation, that apply beyond high risk systems. So there are, for example, um, rules for um, transparency um, for some systems that interact with people. Now, all of these rules, the entire regulation is about AI systems and the manufacturers, suppliers, importers, distributors and so forth of those systems. So I started out with some problems and some, as I mentioned, have already been raised by the other speakers. But my question is, is does this kind of an approach solve the problems I started with? Well, maybe, or at least some of them, or even many of them. But the real question for me is, is it the best way to solve those problems? So to illustrate my point, I've put one of the red lines at the bottom of the slide. Um, you know, the following AI practices should be prohibited. There's a list. I've just put A. You could put any of them there. You get to the same point. Um, so imagine deleting the words in red, right? So delete the reference to AI here and read the rest of that provision or that red line. Now, to me, it, the logic, the policy reason behind the prohibition still applies. The adding of AI system to that makes absolutely no difference to the policy justification for the prohibition. Um, so, 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 and, and this goes for the rest of the act. I can't show you the whole thing because being from Europe, it's very, very many pages, but trust me on this. Um, if you think risk assessments are important, and I do, um, think about whether you should do them for all high risk activities or only those high risk activities within a particular technological scope. So the point can be made across the whole regulation. So why does it matter? Um, why does this point matter? Um, does it matter? I mean, we all, often law solves a smaller part of a bigger problem. Um, isn't it okay just to solve it for AI systems now and worry about the rest later? Well, I've got a few problems with it. The first is that history demonstrates that when we tie the scope of legislation to a particular technological object or practice, it quickly becomes obsolete. Um, many examples of this, my favourite is digital tapes um, and copyright law. So around the world, when digital tapes were invented, there were special sections of the Copyright Act um, introduced about how copyright would work for digital tapes. Um, they didn't think because they didn't understand the concept yet, really, of a digital file in the abstract and the problems of digitisation. That wasn't yet on the agenda, but they knew digital tapes. Now, all of those laws became obsolete because I don't know anybody who uses digital tapes. Maybe they use them in some industries, but 
generally speaking, all the copying that people were worried about is now happening without the tapes. So you get the problem of obsolescence. So the solution Europe came up with is, well, what about make it really broad? If you look at the definition of AI, this is very broad, um, but it doesn't solve the problem for two reasons. First is that sometimes over-inclusiveness rather than under-inclusiveness is the problem in legislation. Second, um, sometimes organisations do inefficient things to avoid regulation, even though the potential harm is the same. So in other words, they'll deliberately do it in a way that falls outside the AI definition so they don't get regulated. And the consequence of that, which is really my third point, is that innovation gets encouraged or discouraged based on the obligations we're placing around technologically driven categories. Now, I'm all for channeling innovation in positive ways, but I don't think we should channel innovation by reference to arbitrary and ine inevitably time limited, if you're thinking about the obsolescent problem, technological categories. Now, if we are using a technical a technologically defined scope, in my view, it should be because the concern aligns with that scope. So for AI, I would argue at least, and I hope that we can have some discussion on the panel, but that the real concerns are both with respect to data-driven decision-making in particular contexts where that's not appropriate, and with respect to over-reliance on automation. But each of those is possible without um, coming within a definition of artificial intelligence. So I'll stop there and I look forward to questions. Well, I have to say, um, I haven't heard that, that uh, deliver that. I thought that was, that raised a lot of issues. I mean, it, it, the issues are particular to AI, but when you think about it, the, the breadth and narrowness of, of uh, legislation is hard enough, let alone when it involves technology that the decision makers probably don't fully understand. Um, and I can take of my own experience the first time, again, in the Apple and Samsung case, I heard the word heuristic. I had to decide about what to do with it when I, when I, I'm not sure that at the beginning, I really had a clue what a heuristic was. So, you know, it's really difficult to make decisions. I mean, for, for lawyers to argue cases, for judges to decide cases, let alone for lawmakers to introduce legislation that will um, do, do good be appropriate and do no harm, which is really some of them, which raises some of the matters that you deal with and how do we relate to these. So, well, I must say when I started off um, looking at this topic, I thought it would get very detailed and specific about how it works. What we've got here are issues relating to how the systems work, some of the factors that come into it, how these, de how these decisions and how these matters are and are not like humans and yet are being potentially legislated for, at least in Europe, or dealt with or not dealt with as the case may be. So it does raise a lot of questions. Before I go to the questions from the audience, I'm going to encourage you to keep them coming. I'm just going to see, seeing there's been a lot of re reference between the panel to each other, um, uh, what, what extra comments perhaps the panel would like to make about the other presentations? Ed's main observation about the, the role that correlation and the challenges that correlation poses. Interestingly enough, that is in some sense um, one of the most important scientific questions that AI researchers are now turning their attention to. That they're realizing the limitations of, of the machines, the machine learning methods that we build today, and how we can move from mere uh, correlation to identifying causation to understanding you know, what are the causal links as opposed to the, the, the mere correlations. And, and as, as Ed said, it, it ultimately poses an interesting um, philosophical question about the very nature of science. Um, Chris Anderson, the founder of TED, um, has put forward a very provocative essay um, suggesting that maybe science will stop being model-based and be data-driven, but we will end up with science which can only discuss um, the data and no longer has those predictive models that have, have driven science in the past. And there's lots that we can do in that way, but whether science will be poorer for that. Um, and then moving on to uh, Lyria's um, issues and concerns, um, I, I actually, uh, in some sense, agree quite a lot. I think that we should be um, regulating ends, not means. Means will be evolving. But having said that, some of the red lines that we are trying to regulate, like facial recognition, 
it's impossible to think of that any other technology is going to be doing facial recognition. So I think in the case of a technology like facial recognition, it is not particularly problematic to say that we're regulating the use of AI to do facial recognition because there is no other technology um, that we have or that we could imagine that would do facial recognition other than AI. Um, Toby, while, while you've made that, before I ask the others to comment on that, that raises a question that was specifically directed to you from um, uh, Margarita, which is, um, after thanking you for your presentation, she says she's working on facial recognition research, and her question directed to you is, do you think that the use of AI for facial recognition should be banned in Australia? She said she's surprised to see that few people warn about the dangers of wide facial recognition tech applications. And, and, and so what is your view on that? It is indeed. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on ABC 730 saying that, that very thing in about an hour's time. <laughs> um, yes, about um, half a dozen years ago, I wasn't particularly worried, so worried, like most of my colleagues, about facial recognition because it was so bad. I remember one of my colleagues gave me a demo and he said, oh, I've got this wonderful facial recognition software. And he said, you put your face there. And I put my face in front of the camera and he said, I was a woman. And so I thought, OK, well, he said, he said Toby, you smile too much. That's why it thinks you're a woman. I said, I surely haven't got enough hair to be a woman. Um, so I thought the harms that were going to be committed by facial recognition were so um, limited because it was so pathetically poor at, at recognizing people's faces. But, but now it isn't. Um, there was a case in China where the police identified a wanted felon in a rock concert of 60,000 people. Yeah. And that shows that you know, the harms that AI do, does are not because they're, they're, they're new, the new ethical challenges. We're always worried about uh, about these sorts of harms. It's it just technology puts these things on steroids. Humans could not look in a crowd of sixty thousand people and pick out an individual face, but computer eyes can. And so that takes us to a new place. Um, and now I'm increasingly at the view that the negatives of facial recognition so outweigh the small number of positives. It is one of these technologies where I I, I really struggle to think whether it's justified to work on it at all. Um, can I just ask Luria what she thinks about that question about facial recognition? Um, I, I think I'd have to give it a lot more thought than I can give sort of on the spot. On the spot. Um, but I think that's a much better argument, right? So one can say that, th that this particular technology, as we can define, is itself the problem. And this is what we don't want to do. I still think you'd have to be a little bit careful with how you do it. I don't know if we'd want to ban, for example, um, you know, Apple iPhones opening based on, on, on recognising the face of a user. But we can do that. We can define the technology being a sort of mass... Um, you know, where you, where you have a crowd scene and you're identifying all the faces, we can we can do that. If you can define it in a way that captures the problem, then a technology specific um, prohibition in this case may be um, the right way to go. So as an example, um, you know, one of the discussion points, I think it's a good one, is that people often, often suggest it should be the real time use of it. That, that um, you know, there are some very positive uses in terms of spotting um, child trafficking, um, identifying missing people that are done offline, that are done by police forces in, in well-controlled environments, and those might be acceptable. But to use it in real-time setting, where it's used in surveillance, as we see, sadly, in places like China to, to as part of the persecution of Uyghurs, um, that's something that we should be worried about in our society. Um, thank you. Um, can I just say before, I, I'm, I'm just going to ask Ed, because I mean, Ed, I can't, I have to ask you this question coming from the Human Rights Commission. You must have thought about this as well. What's your view on it? Yeah, it, it connects a little bit to something that um, um, Liria pointed out, I think, very importantly. And, and that is, um, you first have to ask, what is the proper regulatory object? Um, generally, regulating technology um, is both a bad idea um, but it's also like trying to regulate the wind or the waves. It's incredibly difficult to do because it, it shifts. Um, and uh, ultimately, for all of the reasons that Liria and Toby set out, um, you, you, you generally shouldn't do that. Um, I'm choosing my words carefully here, generally. Um, it's, there are occasions where it is appropriate to re uh, regulate by reference to technology. Um, we, we've always done so in respect of some uh, technologies, um, perhaps nuclear technology is a really good example of, of the technology that is itself very highly regulated for all the reasons that um, everyone would understand. I think that there are things that are 
genuinely novel about facial recognition technology and perhaps some other biometric based technologies. Um, and for that reason, when, when we did our major report uh, at the Human Rights Commission on um, artificial intelligence, uh, we, we focused on the absence of specific regulation um, as being something that meant uh, that when you use that technology, facial recognition, in particularly high risk contexts, for example, when police might use it uh, to try and identify criminal suspects, you've got a real risk that is not being properly addressed. And so, so that is one of those areas where, where we consider uh, an exception to the general rule needs to be made um, and that there should be specific regulation that draws clear lines. Um, uh, you know, there, there are some uh, species of facial recognition, for example, where, where, where we use it to unlock a smartphone where the risks are relatively low. Um, there are some uh, like in, in the policing context where they're much more significantly higher, but there may be appropriate uses if there are, if there are effective uh, controls put in place. Mm -hmm. And then there are some really exotic uses of the technology that I think uh, there is absolutely no justification for. So to give an example of that, um, there were some researchers, I think at Stanford, who uh, used um, facial recognition as a way of um, seeking to determine people's um, sexual orientation just by their face. Um, again, they use that sort of machine learning model that um, I described before. Um, I hasten to say it's junk science, it's complete pseudoscience, it's, it's the modern equivalent of phrenology. Um, but it is so dangerous um, in terms of its potential misuse, some of those more exotic uses, that I do think uh, the legislature needs to step in with very clear rules regarding it. But just to round that all off, I would put that in the kind of category um, well, Churchill described democracy as the worst form of government, except for all the others. Uh, similarly, I think regulating in the context of, re of facial recognition is the worst approach, except for all of the others. OK, well, before I continue on this part of the conversation, I've informed that um, Spetha is now able to come in. So I'm going to um, bring her in now and then we'll go back into a, a broader panel discussion and go back to some of the, the questions from the audience, which are also terrific. Now, I understand that uh, all I have to do is to say uh, yeah, abracadabra. So I'm just going to introduce um, Svetha. Professor Svetha Venkatesh is the co-director of the Applied Artificial Intelligence Institute at Deakin University and the leading Australian computer scientist who's made fundamental and influential contributions to the field of activity and event recognition in multimedia data. So um, I'm assuming now this, this is going to be the moment when she's going to appear magically on the screen. Good evening, everyone. Modern machine learning uses something called deep networks. And if you have a look at these deep networks, they essentially consist of layers on layers of, if you like, what are called digital neurons. And each layer is connected to another layer by these connections. And the output of the previous layer feeds into the next layer and so on and so forth. And these uh, networks can be many, many levels uh, deep. So what happens in these networks is that they are trained not, with not examples the of inputs and outputs. So you give it some input, for example, a picture of a cat, and the, what you want is for the machine to predict that it is, it is really a cat. So how is this done? Um, initially, all these weights are random. So you, know, you feed it a picture of a cat and it will give you some garbage um, in the output. And then you compare it with the real output that you want and this error, you feed it back through the network and keep changing these weights a little at a time. Now, each example, each pair of input and output, which is called an example, will only change it a little bit. But when it looks at millions and millions and millions of these examples, it learn, it's said to be trained so that when you give it something, any other input, it can produce the output. So essentially, when in, in machine learning, when we say learning, what all we mean is that it's estimating the weights of the network. Now, this is the one type of machine learning, and there are other types of machine learning, of course, but this is a dominant uh, form of machine learning today. So what are the types of inputs that you can have? So you can have almost any kind of input. So for example, you could have images. So the task for the machine could be to predict what type of object it is, to recognize the object. So if you look at uh, you know, self-driving cars, for example, they have to recognize what are the objects that they see out there. As 
if you're speech, uh, if you have speech, then you can convert this into a picture like this, which is just nothing but frequency versus time. And this picture can then be used by the machine to predict other aspects. For example, what is the affect? What is uh, what are they saying? Or you could just have text. So you can see that this is a very, very versatile learning machine where you can take many, many kinds of inputs and you can train it to predict many, many kinds of outputs. And of course you require a lot of examples and the more, more complex the task, the deeper the network and more data is required to train them. So what's a good example of uh, machine learning out there? And this is a, a recent paper in Nature. And what they did is they took these radar images and they could use deep learning to predict when there was going to be precipitation. And not only could they do it more accurately in terms of where it was going to fall, but also they could do it with shorter lead time. So they had almost, a, I mean, the typical time to uh, precipitation is about six hours and, and the machine learning could do it, you know, two hours earlier than that. So this is an exam, excellent example of how such machines um, can be used. So what are the things that these kind of current models do well? So the first thing to note is that they require training data, like I said. So the network learns from examples. Some of the tasks that machines do today in machine learning could not have been done even two, uh, a decade and a half ago, for example, face recognition. So in face recognition, it is trained on millions and millions and millions of faces because many of these models have millions and millions of these connections that whose weights have to be estimated. And before, you know, things like Facebook with, you know, so many faces up there to learn from, these kind of tasks would have almost been impossible. So the more complex the network, the more number, the more data it really requires. And there are now modern machines called transformers, which almost seem amazing because you give it, you know, two or three words to start and can write a story by itself. But these have something like millions of parameters that have to be trained, which take months to train on, you know, super mega networks. But the most important thing to remember is that these only learn what's in the data, which is called in distribution. What it has seen is only learned from the examples that it has seen, uh, uh, seen and that, we, that has been presented to it. So this will lead to all kinds of problems, of course, but they can interpolate very well. So if they see two things which are close by, even if it hasn't seen something in between, they would be able to interpolate and say what's, what, what's good in, the, in that part. So what are the issues that come because of such networks that might cause us to worry about them? So the first one is, of course, what I call superficial users of pattern recognition. Now, these machines haven't actually learned anything deep. So, for example, if you have an object recognition system like I showed you, it hasn't really learned what is the real difference between a cat and a dog. It just knows, you know, there are these subtle changes in patterns. And if I put it all together, there's a difference between a cat and a dog. So an example of a superficial use of pattern recognition is to use these kind of superficial things to do very complex predictions, for example, employability. So higher view, for example, has a product that can analyze facial movements, word choice and speaking voices and rank employability. So you can imagine that employability is a much more complex thing that cannot be done by something so simple as that. And of course, uh, since many of the um, uh, many of the employment services take the CVs on the internet, some of these technologies are used and, and are cause for worry. So the second thing, and I'm sure my co I couldn't hear my colleague Toby, but I'm sure he would have talked to you about the bias that comes because of the training data. It is only learned what is in the training data. So for example, even if you've shown it only cats and dogs, it has no way of, of interpolating or knowing or something, even something slightly beyond that. So it cannot go to, for example, a fish or some other category that it has not seen. And this is okay when we're talking about objects that, you know, are in, um, which don't matter, but then it starts to matter when you look at, for for example, machines that have been trained to detect skin cancer. And if they haven't been shown a certain color skin, then they, they're not good at detecting the cancer on that colored skin. And the other thing is that we can use very, if you use very little data to train these complex models, it looks like the, the, the model has learned, but they're actually very poor models because in some sense they have just learned the whole data by heart and they extrapolate very poorly and their performance will drop drastically as soon as they're 
and they're, they're, they're um, uh, applied on, on new kinds of problems. And I guess the, uh, the last point that I wanna talk about that other than in very simple cases where you know the ground truth. So you know, for example, if you're looking at a radiology image and trying to see whether there, uh, there is a cancer or not, you know, somebody, you know, a trained radiologist has said yes or no. But if you are looking at a machine, for example, looking at employability or doing these kind of rankings in much more complex situations, how do we know uh, what it is actually doing? How do we know that it's doing the right thing? And many of these models are not transparent. So they give you a decision and, um, and, then the, and that's it basically, because as you can see, what is the learning? What, how do they explain their decision? It's almost impossible to do because it's distributed among, among those uh, 70 million or 20 million weights that you have in that network. So you can see that these are the issues that cause us uh, a lot to think about because they can, um, and, and these kind of systems are getting embedded in daily applications. So it's important for us to see the ramifications of these. And, and I guess that's why um, the talk in this forum today. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I don't think Stephanie can hear us, but um, I think that was a terrific um, uh, presentation for us because it raised, although she was meant to go first in my original plan, because she was going to introduce some of this material. In fact, she has also synthesised a lot of the other matters that have been discussed. So um, I'm going to go back in. Um, I, I don't, I, but I don't think Spetha, uh, unless someone tells me to the contrary, can participate in the Q and A because uh, she uh, can't hear what's going on. But I, I'm very appreciative, and I think we all must be, of um, the fact that she was she persevered in coming through to be able to give us that presentation. But she also talked about the concept of training data, which of course comes in with a lot of the other matters that have been raised. And one of the questions that possibly, um, I'll ask the other panelists to talk about that question of training of, training of data and, and what can be the bias that can occur in, in those systems. But it also brings in the question from Michael Murray, um, which is, um, who said, well, while human decision-making is not perfect, nor necessarily transparent, so what are we fairly comparing this machine decision-making with? And so, I mean, to some extent, humans are also dealing with their the training data that they've had um, through life's experience or through hearing a case or presenting an argument. So how does it work? What are the comparisons we should be making? And um, what are the dangers in, in the training data used for machines other than those already identified or perhaps expanding on them? Perhaps, um, Lyria, can I go to you first? Um, so I would argue that some of the differences in the way that the AI generates problems is that um, is that we our laws aren't well designed for the kinds of problems that AI generates. In other words, so think about something like discrimination, or if I can just pick that example, um, that is obviously the kinds of that that sort of focusing on the kinds of bias we're concerned about humans having that they might, for example, hire someone because they're male or, or treat someone differently because of their race and so forth. And the design of the Anti-Discrimination Act is very much built around this sort of human error assumption. Um, and that's really the focus of it. If you're trying to get to a sort of similar end place of reducing the kinds of discrimination we don't like, and you're dealing with an AI system, arguably you'd structure that law quite differently. So, for example, we would, you know, the, the idea of, of sort of blinding things and blinding the system and just saying, let's not tell it the race or gender doesn't work um, in practice because there are so many correlates for those things. And in fact, telling systems to remove those variables has secondary problems because if the law is sort of saying the best thing to do is just to avoid race and gender, then there can be a hugely disparate impact that a system might have on a particular population because of those correlates that no one will spot because they can't probably t properly test the impact of the system on different populations and work out where those differences are. So in other words, we do need to go back and look at our laws and look at, you know, and, and make sure that they're as robust when applied to the kinds of problems we get with errors in data and then feeding through machine learning into decision-making systems. Thank you. What about Toby? Do you want to add it into this conversation? 
Uh, I mean, the, the very nature of these systems are trained on historical data, and by the very nature of that data, it reflects the biases of the system in which it was collected. Um, and yes, humans are not a very good standard. Human decision making is full of biases, conscious and, and subconscious, and behavioral psychology is a catalog of all of those biases. And so there is the promise that we could perhaps do better in a more evidence based way if we um, allow machines to help us make these decisions. But equally, we've got a, a, a catalog of examples in the last couple of years where we have handed some of that decision making to machines and, and discovered that they have made just as bad biases. Indeed, in some sense that they're worse because they're black box systems, then they, they don't have uh, the machines. And so can't be, you know, the one significant difference between machines making decisions and humans making decisions is you can hold humans accountable. You can't hold machines accountable. Um, and so uh, there are a dis disadvantage. Um, so there is a promise. Um, I, I want to just make two final observations. The, the first is that you know, ultimately, I think we should hold machines to higher standards because we can, because they don't have all of our limitations. And so we should be striving to, for them to make uh, better decisions than us and, and, and hold them to higher standards than humans, because they aren't, you know, they aren't, um, they won't fall prey to, you know, some of the, some of the problems that humans have. They won't, they, they'll be able to look at larger data sets. They won't be, um, they won't have our, our mortal limitations. Well, you are the person who raised ethical frameworks originally too. So I have a question for you. How do you put an ethical framework into, into the uh, machine decision making? I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Um, and then the second is, is to make the observation, which is people often say, well, we've identified there's this bias in human decision making and machine decision making. Let's just remove this bias. Um, and there are many settings where that's just not technically possible. If we are building a system to select a small number of people to call for interview or a small number of people to give loans, that's a bias. Indeed, the old fashioned name for machine learning is inductive bias. It's finding the right bias on the data set to extrapolate from. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, selecting a small number out of a big set is a, is a bias. We have to just ask the question, is that the bias that we as a society find acceptable? It's not biased against people based on gender, it's not bias based upon a race, but it is bias based upon uh, the probability that you're going to pay back the loan or the probability that you're going to be good at the job or whatever it is that we as a society has decided is an acceptable bias on which to select this small set of people out of the bigger set. There is no unbiased answer. Is it just an acceptable bias? <laughs> well, there you go. I suppose it, you're right. You hold them to a higher standard, but there's still um, there are errors. There are errors at every level. Ed, do you want to come in on this on this point? Well, I think that's a really interesting second part to your question. Um, I think via Michael Murray, which is um, you know, what's the standard that we should be holding machines to? Um, and there, there are a couple of, I think, really important general principles that, that I think we should bear in mind. Um, the first is that if we're making significant decisions, um, we shouldn't um, adopt a process, either a machine or a human, um, if that is uh, clearly going to be the inferior way of getting to the truth. Um, when the truth really matters. And I appreciate that there are situations where the truth doesn't matter so much. But um, in other words, so if, if we're using um, a system to identify a criminal suspect uh, and um, I, I, if it's true and it remains true today um, that uh, on the whole uh, facial recognition technology, the very, very best available is just simply not as accurate at making that identification as a human, acknowledging that humans um, are not that good at that either, um, then, then in that kind of momentous area of decision making, we should not use the machine. Um, it's, it's, to my mind, that simple. Um, the problem is that uh, sometimes we, we kind of lose sight of it a bit because there are some real kind of tech enthusiasts uh, who point to the fact that we're on a really steep trajectory. Um, and it's certainly true that if you take an area like facial recognition, it is improving really, really quickly. But <laughs> that's not the same as saying that it is as good as the state of the art, um, nor is it the same as, as saying it is as good as it needs to be. And, and ultimately, I think Toby makes a really good point, which is sometimes um, for uh, machine decision making, we may actually wish to hold um, that 
um, form of decision making to a higher standard, but it will really depend on the context. Okay. Well, Ed, Ed can I ask you a question, a legal and a moral question, which is, you know, at some point, autonomous cars are going to be better, safer than human drivers. Uh, at some point, they, 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 you know, there'll be one less road fatality next year because um, humans aren't driving, machines are driving. Is that the standard at which we ban all human driving? Um, I mean, quite possibly. Uh, it, it, there are a lot of kind of confounding factors bound up in all of that. Um, for example, uh, you know, some kind of transition. Um, you know, not everyone <laughs> will be able to afford a, uh, a self-driving car immediately or, or all of that sort of thing. But um, ultimately, um, the pleasure that someone might take in driving a car, in my mind, should not be um, given greater weight uh, than, um, than than that question of safety, and uh, and so 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 I, I think you know there'll, there'll be general principles that we can bring to bear, um, but they'll need to be kind of worked through um, in the different contexts that they arise. It brings out another point, if I may say so too, and that is the question we, um, you're assuming in that question to some degree, Toby, that there is a single technology um, that you know decision <laughs> made for standardised technology. What we know from the telecommunications industry is that then you have to look at, um, do you then force uh, manufacturers to standardise all of these technologies? Um, uh, and then you have all sorts of provisions, you know, of, of licensing requirements and all of the other questions, because um, your example of self-driving cars, what if it's a really good technology for a self-driving? I mean, do, do you bring a law in that says no human can drive the car? Because uh, there is a technology out there that has a much more efficient system, but what if not all um, you, uh, implementers of the, of the technologies um, implement the same level of, of that. So I'm just going to leave that open because I think that's a, a, a whole other area. But I'm going to go back. It, it, it's, 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 it is a really good example, though, of the role that regulation of the law has to play. And, and we only have to look at, for example, the aviation industry. Aviation now is far the most safe form of travel by various metrics. You're more likely to die driving to the airport than getting on the plane and flying almost anywhere. Um, and how did that happen? And that's what we should hope for indeed with autonomous cars is because it was heavily regulated. Um, and so the, all the safety lessons were learned. It was a, a safety ratchet that went up. And that's, that's why I, I would welcome more regulation for artificial intelligence because I want it to end up like aviation. Well, then you're getting, you're hitting Lyria's, um, some of Lyria's um, uh, walls in uh, the where, what, how, and at what stage you regulate them. and how wide you go, but anyway, we've, we've started, some of that started and I can see that. Let me just go back to some of the questions that have been actually asked, because there's one that transitions into that from facial recognition, self-driving cars um, and aircraft. We have a question from Sandra is, how will we go about effective regulation and governance in the healthcare sector when new AI devices come, come to market? Does anyone want to have a go at that one? I, mean, I think the starting point should be to regulate the outcome. Right. And so um, accuracy, of course, really matters uh, in the healthcare sector. Um, I think that there's some pretty cogent um, research at the moment uh, that suggests that the best human diagnostician is not as accurate as the leading kind of AI powered tool um, to diagnose certain forms of skin cancer, melanoma. And uh, so, so, so that actually, I do think, raises a really important question, which is then um, if that, that AI powered tool is readily available, um, is, should it still be permissible to use um, the human to, to make that really momentous diagnostic decision? And, um, I, but, but, but fundamentally, that for me is not about regulating the technology, it's regulating the, um, you know, the outcome, which is have you chosen as a doctor to use the most accurate, readily available technique to perform your diagnosis? And if you haven't, have you um, breached some kind of uh, legal uh, stroke ethical rule? Um, have you potentially, you know, acted negligently? Um, and, and in a sense, we, we do that um, all the time, right? So if, if a human doctor today um, was trying to diagnose uh, a patient who was ill 
Um, and that human doctor said, well, look, I'm, my, my method of, of diagnosis is heavily reliant um, on, you know, looking at the stars and checking my astrological signs and so on. Um, we, we, we would know that that's, that's clearly going to get the doctor into all kinds of legal problems. It's not a technological issue. It's, it's simply that they haven't followed the best available um, kind of methodology. And, and so I think we should continue to apply that, that principle. Okay, that's an interesting question. I'd like to I'd see if other people want to comment about that because that, I mean, that might also depend upon, um, there are all sorts of subjective questions there. There's questions of availability in different parts of the world. There's questions of, I'm not a doctor, but questions of diagnosis of something specific that has a specific tool available, not necessarily in the context of the whole body, which might be the, the a doctor's um, view that it's a different, a different matter. So, I mean, that raises a lot of questions for me, but I'd rather hear what the, what the panel have to say about that concept. Does anyone else want to comment about that, about, about the fact that, uh, in fact, there should be, um, I think, on one view of it, not enforced, but um, mandated use in effect. The law would mandate it if no one else did because um, a doctor that didn't take advantage of this particular form of technology might there, thereby be considered negligent. And, and bring his, his or her own diagnostic tools into effect. So yeah. Ed mentioned negligence. Um, and one thing I really like about negligence is that it is completely technology neutral, right? So you can say it is negligent um, and that is a finding in the particular context, but based on what are the technologies available and which ones you, you know, accessed in light of the availability and standard practice and all of those things, um, which I really like. The other point I'd make though, is that a lot of the time with things like medical devices, there's also, um, you know, sp very specific, um, you know, regulation where you have to sort of, you know, get authorization before you can put it on the market, that kind of thing. Um, and we did a really interesting exercise a number of years ago for nanotechnology, very different technology. But there was, again, um, a gap that was identified when you looked at the way the laws were written a lot of nano versions of particular chemicals were falling into the gaps because there was already an existing version of the chemical, the nano version wasn't covered. So why do I mention that? I mention that because I do think it's important where you do have something new or we are starting to, for example, use AI devices in the body and so forth, that we go back to those laws and just make sure that the kinds of testing required, the kinds of categorization of things make sense in the context of those potentially new devices. Okay, thank you. Well, that brings about another question, one that actually I think Toby was going to be thinking about raising himself, but also came into one of the questions from the audience. Um, it is a, a double whammy in a way, because the question from the audience uh, from Natalie was, should an, uh, an AI be able to be recorded as an inventor of a patentable invention? And I think I, was, I, I think we got into this and I wasn't sure how much this went public before Sveta's um, uh, presentation started, but that of course is currently being considered throughout the world. And Australia, an Australian judge has said um, yes, and other countries, in other countries, judges have said no. But it also brings in, Toby, something that you raised, which is can, machi can machines be creative? Because um, an invention is, 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 you know, it's got to have an inventive step um, and matters such as that. So um, can machines be creative and should, um, without going to the law of patents, which is something that I, would, I could spend, you know, the next three hours discussing on whether or not you can have a, a, a machine as, a, as an inventor of a patentable invention, which I won't do because it would bore everybody else witless. Um, but as a general concept, um, just looking at questions of, of machine learning, do you think that a machine, um, a machine itself, um, is creative or can be creative, and should it be, should it, as a layman's terms, be allowed to be named as the inventor rather than the person who drafted the algorithms or anything such as that? I'm going to get Toby to go first on this one. This is a question that's haunted the field of artificial intelligence, indeed, since before we invented computers. A Ada Lovelace. Um, who was the assistant to George Babbage, who was trying to build the first mechanical computer back in the um, 18th century, actually raised this very question and suggested the answer was no. Um, and indeed, you know, whenever we do anything in AI, people say, oh yes, you've done that, but, but AI can't do X. And one of those Xs is be creative. Uh, and I'm very skeptical about that. I'm very skeptical that ultimately we are biological machines um, and most of the things that we can do Ultimately, we've got computers to do. And there are, there are things you can do to make yourself more creative. There are tricks you can do. 
And those are the sorts of tricks that we're starting to teach computers to do. And so computers are starting to write bad poetry um, and write um, and paint paintings that are sold by Sotheby's, uh, write uh, poems, not very good poems. But, but um, um, so I, I do think ultimately um, there's no reason to suppose there's nothing profound about the human brain that makes us the only creative machine on the planet and that we have a few examples. Indeed, I've had um, I've worked on a project with a PhD student where we wrote a computer program, an AI program to invent new mathematics um, that ultimately machines will be created. So I don't think it's a technical question. It's more a economic and legal question, which is, do we want to afford the sorts of protections to the things that machines create that we afford protections to um, humans because that encourages innovation uh, and productivity within our uh, within our marketplaces and that's a question i'll hand over to my colleagues well before we go into that it also raises something else that they, they, i'm going to ask people to comment about um with that and another one which is because does that raise questions about where humans do come into things like ethics is there a role for AI ethics as part of this um, expansion of the role of AI? So, um, Toby, I'll come back to you on that aspect of it because I'm going to go to the other panellists on that. Luria. Um, I think that, that AI ethics suffers at least some of the same problems as AI regulation. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of an example um, of this. Um, so if you look at the, um, you know, you look at the Department of Industry um, and their ethics principles, their AI ethics principles, it says throughout their life cycle, AI systems should benefit individuals, society and the environment. And that sounds great. Um, but most AI ethical principles are literally statements, ethical statements that most people would agree with. And then adding the words AI systems somewhere along the way, which is, I think, at least a bit of an unthinking approach to applied ethics. So ethics are really important. I actually think they should be mandatory in high school. Um, but the way we talk about AI ethics, at least at the moment, I think makes a bit of a mockery of something as deep as moral philosophy. It ignores years of contestation about what are, what is the right way to be in the world and so forth, and pretends that we can sort of make these very simplistic statements when it's about something other than us, i.e. AI systems have to do all of these things. Um, so I, I think, I'm not saying I don't think it would be useful to have deep moral philosophy um, and really consider some of the issues that AI raises. I think that's an important thing to do. But I don't think um, what we're currently labelling AI ethics um, that I've seen um, does much of that. Okay, now listen, I, we are, I've got so many more questions. I'm going to go to Ed for a comment on this. We've got two minutes left in this entire session and I've got so many more things that I wanted to ask and people to comment. You've got things to say and they've got things to say. Ed, short answer oh. on that one. It's a, it's a big question, short answer. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Lyria. It's a very short answer. I mean, I think that there's um, a really important category error that we make sometimes. So Lyria gave the example of discrimination. So the bank, you, you, you go to a bank, like a bricks and mortar bank, you apply for a home loan um, and the um, bank teller says, look, we're not going to give you a home loan because we don't give home loans to people of your gender. Now, everyone would know that that is clearly unlawful discrimination. But if it's an algorithm that has that does that same thing, we start to question ourselves, is that an ethical issue or a legal issue? It's not, it's a legal issue. And we need to categorise it as such so that we can have a proper regulatory response. Uh, I think, as Lyria points out, there are genuine ethical questions that arise in the shadow of the law, and that's where we should have a, a much more sophisticated conversation about um, how they could should be answered. Okay, well, look, I, I'm not, I can see the time, and I'm, and I'm not a good moderator if I don't stick to it. I can <laughs> some of the other questions that have raised have have come up with some very interesting points about whether there should be a 2GA type of um, body that helps deal with some of the matters that we discussed earlier and, and regulate device use and when things should and shouldn't happen. There was a, a whole question raised about accountability for AI, that if AI is going to do some of these things, then how do we hold AI, should we hold AI accountable and how should we do it? Should AI um, should we make sure computers never use the word I was one of the questions so that you know the decision is not being made by a person but by a machine. So is that a transparency issue? There are a lot of other, I can't tell you how many other questions there are. So it's obviously you've stimulated a lot of thought, but um, at the moment we can't get to it because I, um, I'm instructed that we've got to hand over. So before I do, I'm just going to say my thanks. I have 
learned a lot from this panel. I think you've done an, an absolutely fantastic. I thanks Beppa for making the effort to persevere to come in, even though and she had huge technical issues, and I'd like to thank her. Toby, Luria, Ed, thank you very, very much because it's been the interaction between you and the uh, the issues that you've raised, I think, uh, make it clear that the academies will have to have part two of this uh, of this issue in the not too distant future. But in the meantime, and after asking everyone on, online to, you know, uh, at least in their own homes, clap their hands to say thank you very much to the speakers, I'm now going to hand over to the Chief Executive uh, Academy of the Academy of Science, Anna Maria Arabia. Thank you very much, Annabelle. I'm speaking on behalf of the Academy of Science President, Professor John Shine, who unfortunately is unable to be with us today. Uh, before I thank those involved in producing tonight's event, I wish to acknowledge that there have been some technical issues and thank you for your patience as we've dealt with those. The recording of this event will be available after the event on the Australian Academy of Science website. Um, and I encourage you to uh, have a look at it there and share it with others who may be interested. On behalf of both academies, I too would like to express my thanks to our speakers tonight. It's been such an interesting and relevant topic to our times, and it's great to look at things from all these perspectives. It reinforces for me that the intersection between science and the law is rich and needs to be explored more and more. A huge thank you to you, uh, Dr. Annabelle Bennett. Um, it's been uh, wonderful having you facilitate this event and bringing your knowledge, energy and enthusiasm to it. Thank you very much. Thank you to the President of the Australian Academy of Law, the Honourable Alan Robinson. Uh, we've thoroughly enjoyed our collaborations with you and your team, and we look forward to many more in the future. Thank you also to the staff of both academies for making this event happen. And finally, an enormous thank you to you, our audience, for joining us this evening. We hope you'll join us again next year, hopefully in person at the wonderful Shine Dome. Um, with that, I thank you and wish you all good evening. <laughs>